Hello, and welcome to this Airtime exclusive interview. My name is Michael Jonga, and I'm delighted to be here to interview our guest today, Captain Aisha Alexander, a true aviation professional, aviation safety advocate, and an FAA and GCAA ATP licensed pilot. Aisha has an extraordinary passion for flying that started from the early age of four and spans over two decades across charter, corporate, and cargo flight operations. She also holds the duality of having served in both pilot and aviation management positions as an aviation safety manager and international captain for the Coca-Cola company and appointed in 2020 as regional safety advocate for the International Civil Aviation Organization in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. She started her aviation career in 1999 as Director of Human Resources for Aeroflora Cargo, a Colombian cargo airline based in Miami, and later became Director of Operations for the airline. Her pilot career began in 2005 as a charter pilot for Sentinel Jet, where she excelled and went on to be the selected and designated pilot for former First Lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton. And she also flew U.S. Senator Mitt Romney, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. Prior to this, she worked with small 135 operators and part 191 volunteering time to reach the needed experience to obtain a formal job. Over the next 15 years, she flew across the world for airlines such as Central Charter, Trade Wings Airways, Ethiopian Airlines, Etihad Airways, and Amerijet International. Today, she is a Boeing 777 pilot for Kalita Air and an international cargo airline uh, headquartered in Michigan. Aisha, thank you for joining us here at Airtime. Thank you very much. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm, and I'm glad to, he, to be here with you and to share my, my experience and my passion for aviation. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here and your journey is embedded in so many exciting experiences which you've had all around the world. But before we get into that, everyone has a unique story of how they came to join this industry. What is your story and who or what inspired you to become a pilot? Uh, so basically, um, I'm coming from a, a family that has nothing to do with aviation. So my mother was in the, le in, 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 um, in the legal career. Um, I, I just had the passion for airplanes as I was a little kid. I remember myself, uh, the little kid having airplane toys. So I always loved ev um, everything around aviation. When I was, like you mentioned before, when I was four years old, I decided to become a pilot. And in one of the flights that I was doing with my mother, going to her job, I said to her, mom, when I grow up, I want to be driving. And I say driving, driving one of these, one of these. Since then, um, I, I, I fixated my idea to become a pilot. So coming to uh, finishing high school in Colombia, I joined the law um, um, uh, university, the University of Medellin. Uh, because as my mother recommended, since we didn't have no experience in deviation, um, female pilots were not around in, in that time, or at least I didn't know them. So she said, it's better that you go and to have a formal career, and then you can pursue your aviation career. So I did, I did that. Um, we moved, then later on, we relocated to the United States, and I still, I was focused that I had to continue this career. So in the United States, I joined um, American Flyers, and I was the only one, the only female pilot in, in the group of my class. Until now, um, it's very, very often when I go to classes, I'm the only one. So then I, I was at the same time working for Aeroflora, like you mentioned, um, as in human resources, then I escalated the, the positions in, in the company but I was at the same time accumulating my flight time and working to, towards my private instrument and commercial rating. When I finish is when I had the decision to make. Either I become an instructor to accumulate time or I will join regional airlines. At the time it was impossible for me because the pay was very low. So I decided the hardest way ever and it was to start knocking doors in the Air Force life for Lodel Executive, Tamiami, Opa Loka, and I started volunteering time. And it worked. Uh, people were just looking at me like, mm, you know, a girl, but it worked because I was working for free. And now this uh, partner, one, they were giving me the opportunity. 
until the moment that I reach the 1,500 hours that it was required to get the ATP. And then it was a roller coaster. So then the roller coaster started. Um, at the same time, I was uh, becoming um, a, a, a parent. So I had to balance all my passion and my family. And it just worked out, um, thanks God, um, everything with a lot of effort. Um, like I say, I, I continue knocking doors and trying to basically become myself agent to companies. It was very difficult because I remember even coming to some of the places where they say, sorry, we don't hire women. Maybe later on, you can try. And I was just a girl with 1,500 hours, just with an ATP, very little to offer. So this is how I started. And it's, um, and until now, it's just the matter that one door closes, I knock at the, I, 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 I knock at the next door and trying to open new ones and new ones. And so that's how it's been my adventure in aviation. <laughs> And I, I want to come back to the time you started your pilot career. You were flying for one of the sentient operators, and this was back in October 2005. But prior to that, you worked in management positions for Aeroflora, Pargo, and SK Jet. Can you tell us about your transition from management to becoming a pilot? Yes. Uh, basically, that transition, um, it helped because I was in the industry. So although the, the size of operation that I was involved, it was all, all done with the human resources mainly and legal contracts of the company didn't have uh, no, nothing to do with the airline as, as, as pilot or flying, but it still I was in the industry. So it was an easier transition because I was able to manage um, the network. Why, by the time that I moved to SKJet, the first thing that I offered to them was my management experience. So I come into SK um, and, I, and I say to the owner, um, I remember he's from his, he was from Israel, and I say to him, I'm coming from this area. I have this experience, but I have just my ATP. I can help you with operation to help um, enhance your charter operation in South America if you give me the opportunity to, to, to get involved into the charter. A week later, I received the response and it was a positive response. So I got with SKJ as a charter coordinator. So I helped the airline, um, the, char the, the charter company to get some of the customers in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I did the first fly in the Liga 35 with them to San Juan, Puerto Rico, get some of the customers in South America. And at the same time, I was getting my experience. So they gave me the opportunity to have my first type rating in, in the time, an SIC type rating in the Liga 30 series that allowed me to fly the 31, the 35, the 55. So that's how, that was a big step in my career because I already have something else to add into my CV. That, that first non-paid job, because I wasn't being paid for the flying part, but it, but it was already an experience. So that's how the, that's how the transition uh, went from the management, it's still into at some level of management, but now flying the airplane, that that was the ultimate goal, to be able to be in the cockpit, to be able to say, I am accumulating the flight time that I need, the experience that I need. And just, you mentioned something earlier about being one of the first female pilots uh, to operate in the US. Well, specifically in 2003, you were the first Hispanic corporate pilot to operate in the US. And the industry back then and today is still recognized as a male dominated sector. But at that time, did you face any resistance or challenges because people were saying that you're a woman? Um, well, yes. And the fact, um, at the time when I started, there were already female pilots, but mainly in the, um, in the, in the airlines, in the regional and other airlines, because, uh, but as a Hispanic pilot, that was the first one. I did receive a lot of resistance. Like I say, it wasn't easy. I went to some of the operators um, that they say, sorry, like I said before, we don't hire women. Uh, but later on, it happened 
you're welcome to come back. So I was discouraged. Um, some of my colleagues in some of the, the companies that, that I work, they, they bully me. Some of them because I was like, you know, I would say too feminine to, to, certain, to a certain extent. And for them, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to accept the fact that now they have to share the cockpit with, with a woman. So um, I received um, some very harsh comments that I remember, um, but I'm, I'm even happy that I received them because those harsh comments made the strong eye shelf today. So um, it wasn't easy, the resistance was there, but I think that everything that you do in life, you're always gonna have a resistance regardless of the field, regardless of what you're trying, you're always gonna have a resistance from someone, but it's how you manage that resistance and what you do with that resistance that is positive for you, that that's what it matters. Talking about managing that resistance, you, you moved to Malaysia still as a corporate pilot for one of the royal families at the time and said that you found a completely different environment with regards to recognition and acknowledgement for female pilots. Could, could you talk about that experience? Yes. When, when I, I decided to move abroad, it was because the industry in the United States completely collapsed. So we're talking of 2008. And there is me with corporate experience, only domestic. That doesn't help much because all the jobs were abroad. So I, I was determined that I needed to find a job abroad. I engaged myself with um, an agency in Canada and they helped me to get this job in Malaysia. When I arrived to Malaysia, I was surprised that my, 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 one of my managers is also a female pilot. And today she is the ambassador for the um, African session of the 99s, Ivan Alvarez. So that was the first, so I have another lady just like me managing in the operation. So I was like, I'm not the only one. Then it was very notorious that most of the flights that come from India, they always had one female pilot. So now I'm not the only one. So it was a shocking experience to see for the first time that in the other side of the world, it was more normal to find female pilots of what it was in, 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 in United States. At the same time, I remember that when I started my career, uh, I'm sorry, my ground school with um, Academia Antioqueña de Aviación, that is the name of the AAA in Medellin, they were already female captains for Avianca, for ACES, for Aerosucre. So that, it was more normal than what it was in the United States. So it was, it, it was, it was very, I was very happy to see that. And that's why I was so eager. And I say, I'm determined. I have to enhance my international experience so I can become one of these female pilots that will work abroad. So from the start of your career to today, what changes uh, have you seen with regards to embracing the presence of female pilots in the industry? What changes have you seen? Uh, and what changes would you like to see in the future? I've seen a very positive changes. And myself, I've been offering many opportunities. And now in the news, it's more and more common to see the recognition of all these uh, female pilots and all these um, aviators that have a very good representation and positions within, within the, um, the industry. In ICAO, in, in, in Ayara, in Qatar, Etihad, Emirates, is well, well known the number of female pilots. India, like I say again, I think is the largest female community in the world. And here in the United States, it's changing. I can just say it's changing. Not at the same pace as it is in the rest of the world because it's still I don't see the representation or maybe, or maybe that representation or the, um, is not as well recognized because in uh, once is the day of the international women of uh, women in um, most of the airlines, they always advertise all these flights that go 
all, all with women. I even have uh, two, for two years in a row with the Tejal that we went to Bangalore and our flies were, were all female, all, all, all female crew. I don't see that here in the United States. Doesn't mean that they don't have the number of representation. Probably they don't advertise it or they don't make the emphasis yet that we do have this large number of female um, pilots in, in, in the industry. But it's, it's a slowly, slowly, the representation is more, there is better um, acceptation. What I would like to see is, a, a, I would say, a little bit of more, more, more support. But at the end, I am I'm a strong believer that what we do and the places that we earn in life, they have to be independent from our gender. They have to be tied up with our qualifications and with the efforts that we do. So, and this is something that I always advise to all my, my the people who follow me in Facebook or LinkedIn. I always say qualifications, res, uh, resilience is what is gonna take you to where you want to be. Because if we just leave it to our gender, it's, it's not enough and, 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 and it shouldn't be just the case. But as far as this, uh, the increasing uh, community of female pilots, I see it more and more often in the United States. And I'm really glad every time that I walk in there and I see another one, I say, yes, another one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to come back to your career because you, you hold that dual experience of having had your office both in the cockpit at 36,000 feet and on the ground in management roles, such as your roles as a director of safety for various airlines. And all pilots are focused on safety. But during your career, you placed an even higher importance on safety and even became an aviation safety advocate. Tell us why that is so important to you. I believe um, everyone says safety is a priority. For me, safety is a value. It's something that no one has to teach you because it's something that you know is important. It's something that you know is the foundation of the career. And safety is very abroad. Um, a lot of people, for instance, when, I, when I, I started looking into the safety side of the aviation, back then, there was not a formal aviation safety education. So I was looking, in, and that's why I started criminal criminal law, because not the criminal part what I was looking for. I was looking into the human factors that I could later on tie it up with my law degree, a human factors toward the safety until I finally found myself with the surprise. Now there is an aviation safety as a career. But like I say, the safety is a value and that is what I want. That's what I embrace in companies that I work for is what I want people to believe. Safety lays on every and the individual hands. If I believe that safety is what rules my career, what is, is what is gonna make this industry and the sky safer, I have to start from making and doing my part. And then I, once I accomplish that part with the individual, I move to the companies and I move to the execu executive managers and I say, okay, so now let's help this person who is safe to operate, give them the tools, let them report, don't punish them. Because as a value, you don't punish from va for values. You I embrace people who has those values. So safety for me is basically the real foundation of aviation. We are going far and beyond in talking about the priority and talking about regulation, but what are we really doing with the individual? That's, that's my question and that's what I advocate for. What are we doing with every single pilot, every single cabin crew, every single ground personnel? How are we helping these people to become a, an important and determined part of safety? That is my job and that's what I do with passion. That's what I hope that one day the industry will move in from that priority to a real value. 
you, you mentioned that safety is is not just a priority, it's it's a value. And it's, you know, as, as all pilots really focus on that, I want to ask you, when did you know that safety was going to be one of the core drivers for you? At what point in your career did you know that? From the day one. And um, I remember many times in my career had to walk away from a cockpit because it wasn't safe. And I mean, one, one of the times, specifically in Boston, that I was flying for an ex company, um, and the aircraft was going to be overweight, a Learjet. It was going to be overweight. I said, I'm not taking the flight. It was just few pounds. I said, I'm not taking it because the consequences, and it has to do with my legal background. I believe that I oversee the consequences that it will come of, a, for instance, I reject the takeoff. And then it comes into, it was few pounds overweight. You run out of the runway. What are you going to say? I was very determined from the beginning that mm -hmm. if I will continue in this, in this industry, I will do it right. And I will have no shame to say it's not safe. I will report it. And the report is not to make the airline, the operator, not to make them look bad. It's to help them because that's what I, that's what I want to achieve is to help the, um, the operation. So I had that from the, from the very, very beginning of my career. So it's, it's something that I grew up with and it's something that every time I, I try to enhance more, not just with the formal education, but also with the strength to be able to speak up when it has to be, when, when I need to say something. And one of the highlights of your career has to be your experience as the designated pilot flying former first lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton. Only a small number of pilots ever get to fly the first family. So tell us what, what that was like, you know, how different is that from normal flight operations? Well, that was a, that was a great experience. I think that that month was something very, very uh, special um, because I had the opportunity to be with the former um, uh, uh, first lady, Hillary Clinton, and uh, as you say, the Senator Romney. And it's, it's a completely different experience, especially because I, I was new in the corporate aviation and it comes that opportunity that I pass all the background check and I say, okay, now this month during their campaign, you will be with them. It was great. I wish, I wish I could take pictures, but because of the, you know, the, the, um, the operations, I could not. And the best thing, and I remember until now, it was the end of that month when the Senator Romney, and I was looking for this point to show today because I'm very proud, but I think it's in my house in UAE. Um, he gave me um, a gold coin that is the seal of the uh, state of Massachusetts as a thank you. I was, I was very happy. That, that's all I can say. I was very proud. It, it's a different operation. It was a, you, you have to be um, in, in time, more, you're more prepared. You want to be, uh, that everything is, 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 is even better. The, the protocol that you have to follow, but it was a great opportunity. And they, this was through a sentient jet. And I was very, very honored. I'm very happy that I had that opportunity during that campaign. Now, here at Airtime, we've had the opportunity to speak to many pilots and industry professionals from around the world who've shared their experiences of how COVID changed their lives. Your story even involves losing two jobs in the same week. Can you tell us about your COVID journey? My goodness. Uh, I think my COVID journey is, is started from my pre-COVID journey. <laughs> Because um, at the time that I was furloughed from Etihad, um, unfortunately, I thought I was going to retire with the airline, but I was furloughed. It came in the time that I already graduated with my master's in aviation safety, and I was committed just for one year to be in the corporate aviation. And the reason why, it was because um, if I leave the airline industry, 
And I stay with a corporate that I would love to help in many ways. And I'm trying to be involved with IBAC and the MBAA and the MBE in a, MBAA, I'm sorry, in the Middle East with everything possible that I would love to do for the corporate. But yet my, my main role is in, is in the airline industry. So I said, I'm gonna dedicate this one year. The one year is approaching. I'm delivering um, the end of my um, all all the program that I developed for uh, for the aviation department in Coca Cola. Developed uh, and given all the um, all the what what I did to the executive manage my executive manager and leaving the position. And I had a job offer already with another career in the Middle East to go back what I call home uh, to fly again my three twenty. To be a, a, as a director of safety, everything ready to go, COVID hits. So I lost those two jobs within two weeks. So now I'm sitting at home. I had other interviews because the um, aviation was very active last year. And I had uh, three, four interviews that I was going to, because of the job that I already accepted, that I was going to postpone it for later on when some of them no, no, not to attend, mm -hmm. to, to excuse myself from not attending to them. But I see all those interviews canceling, canceling, the industry, all the, all the airplanes grounding, pilots retiring, and airlines saying, this is the end. I sit in front of the TVs and I say, no, this is not the end. This is not the end. It can't be the end. Aviation is about resilience. This is not the end because the pandemic will go over and what is going to happen with all these airplanes on the ground? Who's going to fly them? So I continue and I, and I say, Aisha, you're not leaving the industry. You're not. So I started looking for any job in any part of the world available for a pilot or in aviation safety, and there was nothing. I came at the time, appointed me, as you say, as a safety uh, regional officer for the NACC. At the same time, I got an offer from one of the cargo airlines in the United States. Checking balances. I came, I can say, more than enough of how proud of myself I was that I was reached to that, to that level. But if I take it, it will be the end of my airline career because three years sitting in the office will affect tremendously my career, especially for what is happening in COVID because everyone is, majority of the pilots are sitting at home. When the industry come back around, most of the insurance companies will say, sorry, you have to hire the ones that meet the requirements because our industry is very much managed as well for the insurance companies. So I say, I care what will do it once I get my PhD towards my retirement. So that's, the, that's what I'm working right now. So, but that's gonna be later on. So I accepted the job line, the uh, 767. Um, I, I, I was so happy because I was back in, back in the airline and I feel back, back home with the cargo industry that I enjoy very much. I love my passengers and my cargo crew, but I, because my airline career is starting in the cargo. So I went back to cargo. So it was like I feel uh, back home again. So I did have to take a very difficult decision, even financially, it was a, huge decision be between ICAO and the airline. But I had to do it because if I want to stay alive in the, in the airline industry, that was the step that I had to take. And thankfully uh, that I had the opportunity to choose in, in that time of COVID in this airline, um, the, in the operator of the 767 in Miami, they helped me and they, they contributed to, for me to get out of this COVID um, pandemic, and I will say labor pandemic as well, because we are only still in the pandemic, and there are a lot of pilots out there still that haven't been able to find a job. Others that have to change their career. So, I'm I'm thankful that I was 
focus and I say that day that I say in front of the TV, I said, you know, live in a VH. Mm -hmm. We will continue even with all these obstacles. I mean, there's, there's always also a positive side to, to any storm. And so has the pandemic brought anything positive into your life? Yes, of course. It, it did. One of the positive things is the confirmation and reaffirmation that in any industry, when something goes wrong, the per, if the more qualifications you have, the easier for you to come out. The second thing, the second positive thing is the importance of you being focused on your dreams and, and, and what you want to do and what you want to achieve in your life and the support of your family because there is nothing that you can achieve if you have resistance from your family. But when you have all these, um, your dreams, your faith, your family, all working with you and for you, there's nothing that you can overcome. Everything is possible. You just have to be, to believe in yourself that you can do it. And yes, like if I did it, everyone else can do it. You, you mentioned, you know, having that support from your family, having strong patients and really following your dreams. And your story is one of perseverance, resilience, dedication, and firm faith. And you've put in a significant amount of time to establish your credentials and certifications. At the core of it, what have been the main drivers that pushed you towards building the extraordinary career that you have today? Being a mother, I will say, is the engine of my life because as I had the example from my mother when uh, she raised me as a single parent, as a career woman, and I look after her, I want my son to look after me. And so every step that I do, everything that I do is, is basically for him to, to leave a good example and to be a role model in his life so he can at the same time pass the values to his to his own family so i think um being a mother in an early um, time of my career instead of pushing me back it moved me forward it was for me it was like one of these uh, triple seven engines with uh all these seventy five thousand pounds of thrust i had three times of that thrust with the fact of being a mother and I have to keep going and I have to keep going. And very soon I'm going to do my PhD and that PhD is focusing my son to see that you don't complete one step and that's the end. No, you have to move to the, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So I think that really marked my life in a very, very positive way. And with so many steps and such a diverse and wide career, what have been your most memorable moments or your favorite stories from the cockpit? <laughs> I, it's, I'll never forget this one time I come in um, from one of my flights. Uh, this is back to Central Florida winds and my mother and my, my little son is standing there. And as I open the door of the, uh, of the airplane, my son comes in and he says, mommy, mommy, he comes into the, he comes into the cockpit uh, management allowed him to come into the cockpit um, with me. And that is one of the precious moments I have. And one of my, my most valuable pictures in my life that I will share with you. <laughs> so all those, all, all, all those moments, one time that I was able to, to fly with, with my son in, in, in one of these private airplanes because they allowed him to go with us, the times in Etihad, and many times I have my mother and my son as my passengers. It's so many, uh, uh, so many moments. Uh, sometimes in Etihad, we're landing and I have passengers it's, uh, waiting for everybody to leave, that they want to come into the cockpit to see who's that Aisha Alexander that, that did the PA. And they come, they take pictures with me, they recognize, their, their, their recognition, their appreciation is everything. I think anything that you do in life, 
is appreciation from others is the most important thing. I have my dearest, dearest friend. It's in, it's in, it's in, they are in Nepal, people that I met during my flights to Kathmandu. And until now, we are in contact almost every day. That's what makes this career to be wonderful is the people. And as, as the industry embraces this period of recovery, what advice would you give to other professionals, other people in the industry who are looking for a way back or advice to aspiring pilots and aviators who are looking to join the industry at this unique time? What advice would you give them? Um, well, like this is a very frequent question that I get. And I always um, ask people to look at the same, uh, to th themselves, where are they right now? Where they want to go? Because everyone's approach in aviation is different. You want to go corporate, you want to go to the airlines, you want to go to the military. What do you want to do with your career? Based on where, you, where they want to go, to have the determination that is not easy. That this is not... This is one of the most difficult careers to get in and to stay in. So determination, take a no for answer. No, it's not an answer. That's one of the things. Qualifications. We are in the era of aviation. The most qualifications you have, the more competitive you can be. In the time of COVID, I was sitting at home getting more, certific more certificates from my area. And that's what I say to people. You cannot pay them. Go and do free, uh, free courses. Get all that knowledge in your CV. Prepare yourself because right now, that's, that's going to be one of the biggest door for people to get in and to step in into the industry. So resistance, reaffirmation, being focused on your dream and qualifications is extremely important to stay in in the field. Aisha, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that brings us to the end of this interview, but not the end of our time together. And at this point, I want to say a big thank you to you for your time and for sharing your stories. And now I'd like to introduce the Airtime Chief Executive, Richard Stevenson, to join us as he would like to make a special announcement. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, and Aisha, thank you very much for being here today and for sharing your, your story, your advice, your thoughts, your reflections on, on what's clearly an incredible uh, career. And I know that I speak on behalf of everybody here at Aerotime, and I'm sure across the wider industry, when we want to acknowledge your dedication, your perseverance, and we've heard a lot about your dedication and your perseverance here today and also your contribution to promoting aviation safety uh, and again as a, a former director of the Civil Aviation Authority I know just how important aviation safety is and when I hear someone like you Aisha talking about your passion for uh, aviation safety then you know it really does uh, remind me of how important that work is and I really salute you for everything you do. And also on top of that, everything you do to encourage the next generation of aviators as well. It's really obvious to me listening to you about your level of passion for the industry. Your level of passion is clearly just off the charts. And you know what? I found it really inspirational listening to you. And I know that many other people will do so as well. You've got such a diverse background, such a diverse background of flying from, you know, Hillary Clinton to Coca-Cola. I mean, I'm not entirely sure you could find uh, much more, a much more diverse background than, than you and what you've brought to the industry and what you've brought in fairness to this interview as well. And always, of course, helping others in the industry and helping others who wish to join the industry as well. So it is with that very much in mind that it gives me great pleasure to present to you an Aerotime Aviation Achievements Award. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Richard, thank you so much. I, oh my goodness, I thought I was gonna cry. That's okay. Well, look, this award, I have to finish because I have to tell you, this award is made by the Global Executive Committee of Aerotime. And I, just because, just because I think 
you're going to cry anyway, so I'm going to read you the whole thing. And I'm going to read you the citation because I think you'll want to hear this. So it says, presented to Aisha Alexander in recognition of her dedication and commitment to the aviation sector for her perseverance and focus for promoting aviation safety and playing a role as an aviation safety advocate for her encouragement and support of the next generation of pilots to pursue their dreams, the Aerotime Global Executive Committee recognizes the positive influence of these efforts and the significance of the impact on the aviation industry and its people, both today and into the future. So Aisha, congratulations, here is your award. I'm just, I'm just really sorry that I can't be there in person because I would love to be, but this is gonna be winging its way to you as soon as possible. And we hope that it will take pride of place on the wall right behind you, underneath that beautiful aviation clock, uh, and that it will serve as a constant reminder to you of the gratitude of so many people for everything you've done in your career and that we hope you will continue to do in the future. So congratulations. Thank you so much. This is a, a very remarkable day. Um, I, I can't thank enough and this recognition, like I say, um, sorry, the most important thing in, in, in life is people. And what can you do for them? And that pays off my sacrifices uh, from my family, from my mother, from my son, from my friends, from those who reach out to me all the time with advices, to all of you with this recognition, I can only say thank. And I'm fully committed um, until the end of this life with the God help and support that I can make a difference to make aviation a safer place as a value for all of us. Thank you so much. I really well, appreciate it. Thank, Aisha, thank you so much. And as I said, thank you for what you've already done. And thank you for what all of us know you will continue to do. Um, we'll get this to you as soon as we possibly can. And thank you so much. And I'm now going to pass back to Michael. Aisha, congratulations on your award. And again, thank you for joining Airtime today to share your inspiring story and your passion for the industry. I'm sure that many viewers and aspiring aviators watching will find inspiration from your story, commitment to the aviation safety and perseverance. That brings us to the end of this Airtime interview, but stay tuned for more exclusive content, articles and interviews from around the world. Thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Jonga and you've been watching Airtime. Goodbye.